Welcome to the Mobile Workforce Podcast, where we sit down and have real conversations with business leaders that have been where you are. During these interviews, we'll dive into what it takes to improve systems and champion processes that maximize performance. Each week, our trailblazing guests share their experiences and understanding of the workforce to help inspire change, challenge our thinking, and share what it takes to successfully travel the road to profitability. Now here's our host, co-founder and chief evangelist of About Time and WorkMax, Mike Merrill. Welcome back to the Mobile Workforce Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Merrill. And today we are going to welcome on episode number two of our month-long series of most popular episodes as we ramp up into season four since we began this podcast. We are going to speak with the head coach of the Roofing Academy and the founder of Elite Roofing and the best-selling author of Start It, Build It, Grow It, The Contractor's Guide to Success, and the host of the Start, Build, Grow podcast. A lot going on with Mr. Randy Brothers. Randy has spent 15 years of his own construction business educating others to reach their own potential. Randy's also grown his company by over 12 times in just eight years. On this inaugural episode of the Mobile Workforce Podcast, Randy shares the importance of delegation in order to grow and find success in your construction business. Listen to find out the processes and mindset that delegation requires to be profitable out on the job site. Before making the jump, I want to thank our sponsor, Foundation Software. Foundation Software simplifies construction operations with a comprehensive suite of different software tools, which include construction job costing and accounting, also project management, estimating, safety, mobile time apps, and construction-specific payroll services. With a singular focus on construction since 1985, Foundation continues to enhance its product offerings. Over the years, they've introduced a construction-specific payroll processing service, including trade-specific estimating solutions, known as McCormick Systems, and also Estimating Edge. They also have a collection of field-to-office apps called HQ Suite, That includes both popular safety HQ and project HQ add-ons that integrate with Foundation, and most recently introduced WorkMax time tracking, in addition to its best class product offerings. Foundation software is known as an industry leader in training, ongoing support, and programs that help clients continue to educate and grow. They are a partner that's committed to helping contractors on the business side of construction. For more information, call 1-800-246-0800 or email at info at foundationsoft.com or click the link below in the episode description. Awesome. So your your story, Randy, is one that is actually pretty powerful. Um, Would you mind giving our listeners a little bit of a glimpse into your journey? Uh, Sure. Um, I am, you know, essentially a third generation contractor. Uh, by blood, if you will, grandfather and father were, were you know, carpenters, and and I grew up with a with a with a knack and an interest in building, creating, and then it just as I as I grew up, I kind of developed a love and a passion for construction and building, and just seeing things created, uh, which kind of brought me into construction early on. I mean, when I was like before I could even drink, I was full time project manager. Uh, building homes, doing custom homes, uh, uh, track homes, basement finish, remodel, fire and water restoration. So I've done a ton of contracting and uh, and then kind of, you know, like many of us, many of those have been in the industry long enough, we were all pretty drastically affected by the recession that kind of started in 2006, six seven, and kind of culminated all the way up in 2009. So that affected me greatly. It kind of uh, essentially made me completely have to change the trajectory of my career, if you will. And, uh, you know, originally I wanted to work my way into becoming a, you know, a, a well-known custom home builder. I thought that was kind of like the pinnacle of contracting. And if you can be a custom home builder, you know, build a name for yourself, that was, that was the thing to do. Um, the market and, and uh, the economy didn't allow that. So I ended up learning a lot of lessons and fell flat on my face and ultimately had to completely sh- shut that first business down and file for bankruptcy. Uh, since then, I learned a lot and I'm grateful for it, but uh, I kind of stumbled into the roofing industry, the roofing space. And ever since then, I've been diving and working as much as I can to learn and grow 
within the roofing trade space and uh and it's been uh, been a pretty awesome journey uh up until now well well um thank you for sharing that with us i know it's not easy to talk about those low points and those struggles that um, many businesses go through um some again it uh, gets more extreme and they got to figure things out so I'm glad to hear that you're back on your feet and kind of worked out, uh, kind of reinvented yourself in a different way. Um, what would you do differently if you could have gone back now? I mean, we can never do that, but if you could, um, what what do you think you would have done differently to try and help navigate those, those troubled waters differently? The short answer is nothing because of all the things I learned. You know, I look back. And yeah, it's, it's, there's a lot of people that have experienced similar situations, but nobody's willing to talk about it. There's a lot of pride involved in that. And, sure. and, and I feel that it's kind of my calling and destiny to try to help others who, who have experience or to, to avoid similar situations. So that's why I'm so kind of open about my, my experience, but the things I've learned at a, such an early age, I mean, I, that's all happened when I was 20, 23, 24, 25 years old. You know, so I'm grateful that it happened to me so early in my career that I was able to learn and grow and manifest that to, to where I am now uh, to, to just pour into and help other people. However, economically, I would have paid a lot more attention to the, the, the market around me. I mean, there was plenty of signs looking back that, that kind of identified and showed me that something's not right here, that the market's changing, the economy's changing. You know, the, the housing market, the crisis, all this stuff started happening and I had the blinders on. I was just focused on, I have X amount of basements to finish and I'm trying to get more business. And, and I just kind of completely got, got caught without, you know, really paying attention to, to what's going on around the, the, the world around me and, uh, and kind of got caught, caught, you know, slipping that way. And, um, uh, and ultimately, you know, what, what happened happened, but, uh, I would have paid a lot more attention and I've been a lot more aware of things outside of you know, the narrow focus of the three things I had to get done that at that at a time, you know? Yeah. They, uh, I mean, we often hear in construction, um, it's like you're herding cats out there. It's just a lot going on. Uh, you're, you're performing in the circus every day, you know, juggling acts and all kinds of things. So, um, it's, it is a common thing. Um, the businesses struggle and, and don't always make it through, um, those challenges with construction, just uh, tough business. No question about it. Absolutely. Yeah. So with, uh, with that, um, what would you say as far as, I mean, you, you, you wouldn't change anything, um, just because of the valuable lessons that you learned, obviously if you could fix some things, you'd be more aware. Um, what about the team around you? I mean, is there anything we can learn about that? Um, any, any wins or losses, um, as it relates to the people you surround yourself with? Yeah, absolutely. That was probably the biggest catalyst to my demise was I was wearing all the hats. I was doing everything. You know, I was the guy waking up in the morning, going to do the estimates. I was the guy, you know, managing the crews. And I was the guy at night going in and framing and having to paint and do some of the labor work. And, and I was also the guy driving around with my checkbook on Fridays, trying to pay my subs and pay my help and, and, and wearing all those hats, trying to do everything in a business you know, you really, it's really hard to one, identify what your greatest asset is from a strength perspective to help that business grow. And, and you, it's hard to be really good at one thing or two things because you're marginally average at everything else. I mean, I could have been the best framer in the world, but if I can't spend all my time framing, how do I really master that craft? I can be the best business mind or business visionary in the world, but if I'm spending all my time doing all the other things, how do I become the best, you know, visionary for my business? So I had to, you know, figure out how to take that plunge of uh, finding and, and, and getting other people and surrounding other myself with other people that are really good at the things that I'm not good at. And that can also do the things that, that, that I didn't, I shouldn't be allocating my time towards doing. Yeah. That's uh I'm having might might even be PTSD. I'm having flashbacks myself of the construction years where you're I mean, I remember too laying walls out and thinking, you know, I'm I've got some twenty three year old kid and I'm like thirty and he's he's the G C on this big project and I'm framing all of his houses and I'm thinking, What's wrong with this picture? You know, I'm seven years older than this kid. 
why why am I framing houses for him? And uh, it was the same thing. I was in my own way a lot of times, um, yeah. busy with the hammer and not using my mind uh, to grow the business as much as, you know, perform labor. And I was that kid and I still made a time. I still <laughs> failed. It's like you still, you still, you know, aren't able to just naturally do it without, you know, really having the right people, system processes. I mean, it's like you, you hit it all the time, right? I'm sure people talk about it all the time, but there's, there's, there's so much value in, in people. You have to invest in others. You have to find the right people. And there's, there's some luck, there's some faith, there's things that you got to, the outside of, of your control that have to kind of go right for that to work. But all you can do is focus on you being the best person and, and understanding what your strengths are and just put yourself out there and don't be afraid to have uncomfortable conversations and, and, uh, you know, it, look towards mentors and ask people who, who have the success that you want to have or know what you want to know. Like, don't be afraid to reach out and ask them, you know, Hey, can we go to coffee? Can I learn from you? Can you teach me? Can you share with me what you've learned? I think that was a key catalyst as well is, you know, I just, you know, I wasn't afraid to, to seek out mentorship. That's great. And it, and it sounds like, again, you're you really, if I'm kind of reading between the lines, um, effective and proper delegation is a gap that probably a lot of young entrepreneurs struggle with. And it sounds like was, you know, something that you were struggling to find as well. Yeah, I had a hard time with it. And then, you know, I, you know, I was able to, to work my way through that. And, and for me, I was, you know, lucky because when I, when I kind of switched from, you know, wearing all the hats and doing everything to, you know, building a, starting a roofing company, I started off knowing that I needed help and I can't do it all myself because I learned the hard way. So before I ever even started, I had hired my mom of all people to, to help. I knew she balanced me in, a, in many ways. So I hired her to, to help me with the books and help me manage the office. And, and then we just together, just piece by piece, continue to grow the business and add the right people. And we made plenty of mistakes. Not everybody stuck. It wasn't, you know, the team we have now definitely wasn't the team we had then, you know, but again, you, you still have to go through, it's like a rite of passage. Like you got to just hire and train and develop. And if it's not the right person, no one to let them go and no one to bring someone else in. Yeah, I think it, and it, it sounds like, I mean, it's really similar and you know, I'm in the software business now. I mean, you do some different things, uh, obviously as well as an entrepreneur, but, um, what I'm hearing and, and what I've heard often is sometimes the people that take you from, you know, zero to 1 million aren't the same people that take you from 10 to 20 million. You, you kind of have to work through that and figure out, you know, what those gaps are, who those people are that you can delegate to. Um, I, I like what you said about focusing on people and process essentially. Definitely. Yeah. It's, it, it changes, but we, we, we two, you know, one thought, I guess one, I think that we go through this where, you know, we think that we have to, we have to hit, hit a home run every time we have to hire the exact perfect person to get us to that $10 million, that huge level. But it's not, that's not, you're not going to, if you have that mindset, you're just going to be stagnant. You're not going to ever get there because you're not going to actually take a risk on this person that's right in there in front of you that might be able to be developed into something bigger, better than what you think they are, you know? So, and that's another thing we've learned is, you know, some people that you don't even realize that the potential they have, you go out on a limb, you give them an opportunity and they may end up being, you know, a catalyst or a leader of your company 10 years down the road. You never know, you know, but if you're looking for that perfect person with a perfect amount of experience every time, you, you're, 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 I think you're going about it the wrong way. Yeah. So what are, that, that's very interesting. You know, I think you're spot on. Um, what are some of the characteristics that you're really looking for when you're trying to find somebody that's moldable, that has that potential? Are there certain characteristics or traits or ways that you vet them? And have found that to be more effective than, you know, maybe what you did previously. Absolutely, and and I can't even take full credit because I'm I'm quoting Patrick Lencioni here, um, you know, well-known author and, and works with teams and that sort of thing. But you know, but the concept of the three characteristics of humble you want someone that's humble. They're moldable. They're teachable. They're learn. They're they want to learn. They're not arrogant, right? You want someone that's humble. You want people that are that are uh, hungry right? Motivated. They're hungry. They want to learn. They want to grow. And you want people that are smart. And this isn't, this doesn't mean the MBA. This doesn't mean, 
you know, highest score on the SAT. This means that they're just people smart. They're really good with people. They're, 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 they're self-aware and they're, and they're sharp in, in a sense of, you know, human into human interaction. You know, those are the three characteristics that literally we've built into our company and uh, that we're always looking for when we're, and it's not, the, it's easier said than done, but that's the characteristics of people that we're looking for. And those, if you have those three components, uh, you can, you can go a long way and you can really develop people into, into awesome, you know, entities, awesome assets for your business. Yeah. And like you said, I think, I think one of the, um, you know, one of the key, key points that I heard is you got to give them an opportunity. So you kind of have to extend, maybe, maybe put, put a little bit of extra faith in them to allow them to bloom and flourish into something more. I love that you mentioned that because I think, and I talk about this when I'm coaching or speaking or something, I talk about this where, you know, we as entrepreneurs, as leaders, as owners of companies, like we have an, an incredible gift, an incredible like blessing that, that, that we're able to create opportunities for other people. Mm -hmm. Yet we don't take advantage of it. Like we're scared. We don't take ownership of, you know, we literally can create jobs and create opportunities for people that can define their family for generations. That's big if you think about that. Like if you can actually process that and take ownership of of what the gift you have to give to others as an entrepreneur and as a business owner, why wouldn't you grow? Why wouldn't you invest in people? Why wouldn't you, you know, extend opportunities to good people that, that, uh, that just want to do right by them families and want to be a part of something bigger than themselves. Yeah. I love that. I, I think, uh, I think back to when I was in construction and that was something that I would talk with my staff about all the time is, you know, we're impacting hundreds and even thousands of lives every day by what we're doing. We're, you know, we have hundreds of people that are working on our projects and their families are counting on that revenue and that opportunity. And so um, I love that you mentioned that. And I, I really, um, you know, if you've got that potential and that drive and that ability, you've been blessed with those gifts, uh, for lack of a better term, or talent. Um, I don't think I don't think you can be satisfied just being another sheep in the herd. You know, you really need to stand up and, and fill those shoes. Yeah, absolutely. You know, if, you're, if your only focus is to provide for yourself and your family, great, that's totally fine. But, but why be an entrepreneur? You know, sure, you can be a one person to start a business, that sort of thing. But what's the old saying? If you're not growing, you're dying. You know, it's like, I, I think, you know, we want it. We start businesses. It's not about money. It's about freedom. We want to earn freedom to spend time with our families, to watch our kids grow up and to, to do what we want when we want to travel and to, to not have to worry about the financial aspects of it. The best pathway to freedom is to build a system and a process within your business that allows for consistent, measurable growth, but also through development of other people and, and development of leaders. And that'll, that allows you to get that freedom that you want, that you, that, that, that's the reason why you started your business. No, I love that you just said the development of leaders. So really your role is to help empower them and give them an opportunity to help again, lead others. So you're, yeah. you're really um, kind of like the shepherd, you know, leading, leading your flock, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. So what I, yeah, I was going to ask you what, what your why is. And I mean, I heard a lot of things in there that I think are a part of that for sure. But I mean, if you were to boil it down to, you know, why are you doing this? I mean, you, you could have a lot of, a lot of companies that struggle or fail, fall on their face. Like you said, um, they might tuck tail and run and go do something completely different, you know, go get a job, you know, working somewhere else with an auto mechanic or something just completely different. Why did you come back to construction and why are you so passionate about it still and, and today? Well, construction, I, I, I led to my, my demise or failure or I don't even want to call it that, but, you know, I led to that place, you know, through construction, but it was construction that also brought me out of that place and provided me with an amazing life and amazing family and amazing opportunities, you know, so I owe it to, to the industry that my life and, and, it, it, and I'm passionate about helping other people have similar experiences and similar opportunities and helping guide them along their journey of, of seeing what the true fruits can be 
in the construction roofing space. You know, but if you were to just narrow it down, like when it comes to roofing specifically, mm-hmm. you know, I launched my biz- my business with the why, or we established the why of, you know, create us uh, uh, challenging the status quo. And, and it, it's like, and I love this. It took it directly from Apple, right? It's like, do something different. Like, how can we go into a market and challenge the status quo and then look for ways to differentiate yourself in all facets of business and find ways to, to find niches and, and grow your business and, and capture different markets and segments and different ways of doing things that can separate you. And that mindset has really led to some op- awesome opportunities, growths, failures all the all the above but we've growth we, we've grown a lot through that and the second component is what we just talked about and that is creating opportunities you know i truly take ownership you know i feel like i'm put on this earth and i'm an entrepreneur and i was given the, the entrepreneurial gifts that i have because uh, you know i'm able to create opportunities for people and i take ownership of that and i love that and that's kind of my why is is really challenge a quo and, and create opportunities for others yeah, I love that. I I can relate to that where you just you feel just such this strong you, urge and and you're compelled. You you feel like you're it's almost a calling, like you said, to you know this is what I was meant to do. And uh, I think um, I think that is rare. I think it's unique um, as an individual that you've been able to identify that and then channel it and actually you know take take ownership of that. Um, to help guide and direct you, because I know, I mean, one of the th- one of the challenges in any business is finding employees or um, team members, um, partners in your business, essentially, to help build that vision that are a good fit. And uh, I, yeah, I'm I'm curious, what what types of characteristics do you look for in trying to find people that line up with your vision of your why? Well couple different components to, to dissect that a little bit and and I think as humans we have a natural tendency to want to find people and surround ourselves with people who are just like us and I think as business entrepreneurs we have to think differently you can't just surround yourself with a whole bunch of people just like you that's a recipe for failure you have to look for people that are uniquely different but that also share the same value set if you have the same values and the same big picture and, and that sort of thing, great. But a different way of approaching things and a different strengths, I think that's the actual recipe for success. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I like that. So they, so really, um, I mean, if you've got the same, you know, we always talk here about, you know, planting a, a flag up on the hill on the mountain and that's where we're all headed and everybody knows that and we all may take different paths to get there. But the key is that we never lose sight of that flag. And that every step that we take is going to take us closer to the direction of getting to that destination. And that's something you can measure off of. Um, it, you know, if this doesn't get me closer to that, then I probably shouldn't be doing it. Right. Yeah. Well, and also you want to add the component of if you get to the top of that hill and you plant that flag and you're having to look down at other people. Yeah. That's the wrong mentality. It's like, it's not just for you. It's for everybody to, to come up to that level and to bring as many people with you to the top of the mountain as possible. You know, I think that's where some of that intrinsic value and in, in, in comes from. Yeah. We win together, right? Absolutely. All ships rise, right? That I love it. Yeah. So, so I think, um, you know, from what I've seen and, and what I've, um, witnessed myself is when you can have that kind of synergy and kind of followership where people are really buying into, um, that direction and that vision that you have, um, people are empowered. Feels like employees want to want to be a part of that team. They want to win. We all want to win. I I, I very rarely meet anybody that says that I don't care about winning. That's something, right? So, sure. how do you how do you do that and still maintain a level of kind of control and direction in case in case you gotta you know kind of steer someone back in line or correct somebody that maybe maybe wanted to approach something that didn't fall within your value system. Establishing clear expectations all the way across the board. Um, you know, our job as leaders is to, as CEOs, as fiduciaries, as bosses, you know, as founders, is is to lead, teach, and inspire others. And 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 you can do that in a multitude of ways. But leadership through empowerment is something that we really practice. And I love that you mentioned that because you know we want to empower our team to make decisions to 
to learn from their mistakes and to make mistakes and to not, you know, you know and, and to, to not be operate out of fear, right? But you also got to establish clear lines of expectations, key performance indicators, like really defined rules. Like this is your job. This is your role within the business. Stay between these lines and, and make decisions and push your, push yourself forward. We will support that. Once you start going outside those lines, then we're going to have to reel you back in and get you back in line with, with what your purpose is for the, for this specific business or this specific project that we're trying to complete. Yeah, I like uh, I like that you mentioned. Um, you, it sounds like you're saying you know failure is kind of okay. Like it's um, that's just part of the process, right? Part of part of perfection is yeah, uh, failing forward, right? Yeah. Ask ask every every entrepreneur, everybody you meet or or you bring onto this show. Ask them, you know, what is the single most important catalyst for their learning. What's that universal answer going to be? Failure, mistakes. Yet we run our business completely opposite. We run our business as if you can't fail, do everything you can not to make mistakes. And then we hold people back because we're afraid that they're going to make mistakes or that we have, we make made a mistake by letting them fail or by letting them, you know, you know, make a mistake that catastrophic for the company. But the reality of it is, how many mistakes or mistakes are actually catastrophic to the company? You know what I mean? Most owners are the only ones going to make that level of mistake, right? right. So you kind of got to, got to be able to know when to kind of let that leash out a little bit because you've learned and grew because of your mistakes and your failures. Why not, you know, have a, a culture where someone can fail and learn and grow and, 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 you know, make up for their mistake without, you know, fear of, losing their job or fear of being ridiculed or fear of, you know, you know, s some other negative thing happened to them from their leadership. Yeah. I mean, you think as a, ch as a child, you know, you're, oh no, dad's home. Or if, if you're afraid of the, you know, someone's going to lower the boom on you because of something, then you're, you're running scared. You're, you're operating in a totally different place than um, being proactive and taking ownership. I, I think it's empowering when people can, you know, and we all struggle with this. Um, I, I certainly do owning those mistakes and being okay with it, maybe putting those out in front and saying, you know what? Yeah, I screwed up. You know, I'm not going to do it again, but you know, I'm going to learn from it, but I, I definitely made that mistake and I don't want to do that again. Yeah. And I think we have a natural tendency, you know, when it comes to self-awareness where we're naturally going to act the way we learned or the way we were brought up or whatever. And maybe, you know, there was some, there's some underlying things where, you know, we worked for other bosses or our parents were, you know, rigid and like, you fail, you messed up and, and we caused that fear inside of us. So therefore we have a natural tendency to lead with fear, whether we even are aware of it or not. You know, we lead in a sense that you made a mistake. I'm going to yell at you and belittle you right in front of everybody and make you make it right. Versus the empathetic approach of, what did you learn from this? Did you learn from this? How do we make it, how do we fix it and make it better? Um, you know, we can't have this mentality of everybody's replaceable. If you are, if you lead your company from a perspective of everyone's replaceable, man, you will be replacing them and they're not going to want to perform and they're not going to perform to their best ability because they're freaking afraid. They're afraid of losing their job. They're afraid of letting you down. They're afraid of, of not performing well. So they're, they're, they're going to, they're not going to ever reach their full potential with that sort of leadership strategy. And, and a lot of us just aren't aware that we're doing it. So let's, let's do some self-awareness and, and really look inside at how we're leading our people and how we can make the changes ourselves and take ownership of our own roles as leaders to help empower our subordinates to, to be the best versions of, of themselves. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, to your point, it seems like sometimes if we, we harp on those things in the negative, um, sometimes it's just self-fulfilling prophecy. I mean, you're, and then, and then we're excited or almost like we're smart because we, we said, I knew you were going to do that. I knew that was going to happen. And it's like, you know, that's, that's not a safe place for a team member to be. And if your goal is to work together to build something great, you're going to, you're going to run out of people to turn to when, when you need some other hands, like you were saying. Yeah, very much so. So, so what 
um, what sorts of technology tools do you use or, or do you advocate for to help manage employees to kind of give them those rails to stay within, to provide direction of what they're doing and being accountable for their production and the work that they complete? Oh man, I know we're trying to wrap this thing up, but that's a whole nother podcast because (laughs) we're, you know, I'm, you know, borderline millennial, right? And it's, I'm all about the technology. Our, we're, our company is hundred percent paperless, you know, everything from our contract to everything we do is all digital. And, and it, and the foundation of that is a great CRM system, you know, so whatever industry you're in, you got to have a great CRM customer relationship management system that you can anchor everything you do. And for me, I prefer a system that is customizable that also integrates with a bunch of other platforms and a bunch of other software. So, I mean, if you were to total it up, we're probably using 10, 15 different softwares day in and day out to, to help run our business and different to everything from, you know, uh, hail tracking apps to photo taking apps to, you know, uh, time tracking apps, you know, what you're doing and, and, and all these other things. So yeah, you, there's the technology will, will, will help you build duplicatable, repeatable, scalable processes in your business. And if you're not looking for constantly looking for ways to improve and leverage technology, you're, you're probably going to get beat at some point. You're probably not going to scale and grow like you want to, because you better believe your next door neighbor, your competitor is looking at technology to, 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 to find ways to improve their business. Yeah. If you're not using tech and construction today, you're late, <laughs> you're behind. Oh yeah. Way late. Yeah. Your competitors are. So oh yeah. No question about it. Yeah, your competitors are creating technology. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. So they, yeah, we may, we'll have to, maybe we'll have to connect on another day and go down that rabbit hole for a bit. Cause I'm sure, I'm sure we could riff on that for quite a while. Um, yeah. Well, if you ever watch my podcast that you mentioned earlier, the star build grow show, um, we're sponsored by what I call kind of in my roofing space, the core four, you know, technologies. And it starts with the CRM, which is job Nimbus that we use. And it's integrated with a number of other technologies. And the other three is for, for those contractors, you know, a lot in our market, you know, we get a lot of hail damage and hail happens. So hail trace is another one to trace that and gather data and information to know where homes are damaged. So hail trace is another one company cam. I'm sure that you're familiar with that one. And that's, you know, photo documentation. You take photos are everything and all the way across the board and contracting photo and video is just, if you're not doing that, you're way behind the times. So definitely do that. And then uh, estimating software that we use called sumo quote, those four that to me, I think that's like the core four of technology that you, you must have in order to, you know, position yourself to, to, to be at the, at the top level of your game and roofing right now. That's great. Yeah. I love, I love where your mind and your direction are on those things. What, with your roofing Academy, do you, so do you bundle softwares like that or do you just have recommendations or packages or all the above, actually, um, I, I have different levels of, of uh, membership that include some of those softwares, uh, and then I'm partnered with all of them in a way that my members get discounts or extra training, or you know, I'll bring them on as guest speakers for my private group sessions and stuff like that. So, yeah, I definitely leverage that a lot and uh, try to provide that value and in, in helping companies get set up with the right technologies to build their companies. Absolutely. Wow. That's great. Well, good for you. That's uh, much needed in the industry. And, and although we, we might think everybody's kind of catching up to speed with technology in construction, we're just uh, historically laggards. And, and I, I think I think we're still a little bit behind. Half the companies out there really aren't adopting technology like they should be yet. Yep. They'll be coming around. Yeah. If I, if I have anything to do with it, I'm helping. I'm trying to encourage it. I love it. Um, well, so to to wrap up and had an awesome conversation today, and I'm uh, I like I said, we need to connect up and maybe talk a little bit further on another episode. Um, Let's do it. But uh, what's one kind of hack or process that you've kind of developed, or kind of a secret sauce, if you will, or superpower? What's something that you've really kind of harnessed in your business life now that you've learned over these years, and and how might it help someone else? Man, that's a good question. Uh, go a couple different ways, but I, I think I'm going to lead with my personally as I've grown as an entrepreneur and and 
and and I have multiple businesses and I have my hands in a lot of different things and I love it. That's what, what I love to do, right? And how do you actually do that and be effective and build these things that grow? And and I've developed, you know, a borderline obsession with what I feel is the most important commodity in business, and that's time. Mm-hmm. So I'm I'm very, very intentional and borderline obsessive about my time. If it's if I can delegate it or it, or it can be automated or I can eliminate it um, or or I can find you know a defer or whatever I'm going to do that you know I'm going to prioritize the absolute most important thing at any given time throughout the day throughout my week you know as I'm working through my list of things to do and and I'm very very like adamant and, and obsessive borderline obsessive with my time and uh, and that has. That has, I think that's kind of the secret sauce. Uh, when you really appreciate how valuable time is, it changes your perspective as an entrepreneur. Yeah, well said. Yeah, I love it. Well, that's a great way to wrap up. Well, thank you so much, Randy. Very much enjoyed the conversation today. It was a lot of fun. And, and uh, like I said, I look forward to doing this again down the road when we have an opportunity. Thank you for joining us today on the Mobile Workforce Podcast, sponsored by About Time Technologies and WorkMax. If you liked the conversation we had today or were able to learn anything new or helpful, please make sure to follow us on our WorkMax page on LinkedIn and on Instagram at WorkMax underscore. And subscribe to the show on iTunes or your preferred podcast platform so you will never miss another insightful episode. Also, if you enjoyed the podcast, please leave us a five-star rating and review and share the show with your friends and colleagues. Your support means the world to us and will allow us to continue providing impactful information with others looking to improve their results in their business and in turn, their life.